Hi everyone and welcome to this week's episode of Fight Chat Friday from TKD Coach Academy. This week we're looking at the idea of tactical decision making, those crucial decisions that are made in the moment within the match, what they look like, how to recognize them and of course how to train for them. So stay with us for this one. everybody welcome back to fight chat friday so this is an important one because when it gets down to the nitty-gritty techniques are usually at the same level and and it's this decision making that makes the difference in the high level matches so it, it's can you impose your kind of strategy and your the tactics you want to use to be effective because in, in itf sparring these rounds are quite short two rounds of two minutes you need to get going ASAP. You, you can't just kind of hang back and suss things out like they do in professional boxing, for example, with 12 rounds. So we, we need to be able to be very good at our, um, like almost our improv decision making. And, and we're going to cover a couple today that come up very frequently in nearly all matches and that are um, very important tactics to be aware of that you should be almost making decisions of every time that you train and get into um, sparring situations and free sparring. Yeah, and I think the important thing for people to understand uh, it, when we tactics and strategy are thrown out there like they're the same thing the whole time so we have to kind of i think draw a line between the two that defines them one from the other so that you can really understand what we're talking about in this video so to my mind to our mind strategy is for the whole match it's you know what do i do against this opponent it's um how do i want to set out my stall what's my game going to look like so that's the it's the bigger picture plan whereas the tactics then are those responses in the moment to the game state, the situation on the board, the challenge that your opponent is presenting to you, the shot that just landed or the the warning that was just you know given or conceded. It's those decisions and the actions that you take because of them that are tactics. That's what we're talking about there. And of course, yeah. they vary from person to person because everybody has a different yeah. game. And so your, 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 you know, your tactics are going to change depending on what the opponent is and what your game is. Yeah, you have to be able to make the decisions in the moment then. It, it depends on the situation exactly so you can't you can't be just like set on okay this is what exactly i'm going to do because there's an infinite amount of situations that can come up so let's start with maybe one of the first ones that it kind of borders on you know depending on the information that's available sometimes this kind of filters into strategy but you'll often know what your opponent's greatest threat is before you step in the ring it's one of the conversations that very often a coach will have with a competitor we need to deal with this Okay, our plan is you go out and you do your thing and from their side we have to deal with this. So one of the first things that we'll look at is dealing with the biggest strength that's being presented to you by a fighter. So let's start with, and we've got a lot of clips today from uh, the uh, final of the team sparring Germany versus Poland from 2019 uh, in Inzel. And uh, in this one we've got uh, Ahmed I think in, in blue against uh, Mateusz Mrotz. Yeah, exactly. So obviously here, um, Mateus is quite tall and rangy and he's pushing back from the get-go. So Ahmed realizes this very quickly and he recognizes that he needs to go forward and close down that leg. So that adjustment there in the first, what is it, 10 seconds mm -hmm. is very important. And, and it's all those mini battles throughout the big battle of the, the two minutes is what's going to make the difference. So it's very important that you can almost recognize that, say, OK, this is what this person is trying to do and try to shut it down as best you can and give your strength back to them. So you're almost putting it into your hands to give them something to worry about now. Exactly. So then we move then into the idea of setting traps. So, you know, we've established a pattern where you're just like, okay, Ackman wants to uh, make sure that the distance is never right for Mateusz to get that, you know, big front leg working. So then it comes to the point of, well, tactically, he needs to set traps. He needs to set opportunities for his own scores. Uh, and so how does he go about doing that? Yeah, Mateus does a great job there. He even leans in the head because he knows now that Ahmed wants to come through hands. We've just seen it right here. Mm. And now the next sequence, he's making a decision in his head now. He's, okay, I'm going to set him up for this again. He baits him in, fakes yeah. the head, and then he waits for it, and then he sets him up. With a, so it's quite a unique shot, really, a counter switch dolly up. <laughs> but it, the, the length that he has, he gets a nice distance on it, and he gets a return on the scoreboard, as we can see in the corner. So great at... Uh, great like way to adapt in the moment and make that tactical decision that needed to be adjusted so over those first two clips we have the over and back we've got the you know Ahmed recognizing that 
and um, Mateusz has that advantage of that long front leg and that if he doesn't actually find a solution to that it, the, the fight only goes one way and mm. then on the reverse of that uh, you know you have Mateusz recognizing okay okay you have a solution in mind you you have something you want from me so I'm going to offer that to you because I have a better chance then of developing a counter yeah exactly so it's like you said earlier setting the trap so these are all kind of mini battles that are going on at the same time and like at this high level there's many of them going on because there's other things that come into play as well um so even like the the score of the match for team sparring is another kind of um factor that's at play so we'll yeah it's, it's very later. hard to, to, to bring all this in um so the, the decision making you need this is a skill and you need to practice it you can't just go out into a match and expect it to be there it needs to be something that you work on day in day out and of course, we'll come to the, the how to train a bit later. So in this one, we're looking at uh, uh, Zook going to hands directly. Uh, and let's get into the why of that, I suppose. Yeah, so like this is a um, bit of context here. He's after getting pushed back a few times here already off the front leg. And he recognizes, okay, I need to pick the moment now to go. And he puts the pressure on and he tries to really burst through there and get the hands and put his opponent on almost on alert because he, now he's going to be thinking, okay, maybe I can't be going just kind of half uh, kind of committed to that front leg. So he has to be more alert. Um, so it really puts him on, on hold. It's kind of telling him, okay, you're going to have to vary that a bit more, be a little bit more yeah. challenging with it. You can't afford a lazy leg lift or I'll punish you. And that's just putting a little bit of a mental strain back in your opponent. So, yeah, again, uh, quite good from Zook there. And, and this is just another clip from the same fight. So yes, yeah, again, similar idea. They, they're recognizing each other's strengths here now. So they're they're looking. There's another one as well. So at the st this is the start of the mm -hmm. match actually. So Zook is trying to come, actually come up with multiple ways to get rid of that front leg. So he looks at an angle and hands. He looks at a direct spin. He looks at um, just coming under it as well. So that he actually is trying to figure that out at the very start of the match. That's a good thing to do. Is like to give different looks as early as possible, while trying to stay safe, not give away any easy scores, but. You're kind of getting a read of, okay, this will work, this will not work. Yeah. And then once you find a plan, maybe you can kind of stick to that for a bit longer unless you come up against like the problem we seen earlier with Mateus where you get traps set on you, but that's a different story. Because this is the thing, unless you've really studied a particular opponent or you've fought them a couple of times before, you know it's a psychic that's coming at you, for example, but you mm. don't know exactly the pattern of it. Like, you know, what's it going yeah, to look like? And feel, it. Yeah, exactly. So the range that it takes... What step in? What do I see? You know, what's what, when I'm, I'm actually standing, you know, three feet in front of this guy. What am I actually seeing of this kick? And you know, what angles are open to me? What choices do I have? And you know, for someone like uh, an experienced competitor like Zook, he has five or six options that he can take yep. against a psychic, and he needs to figure out which one against this particular opponent is the effective choice. And as we said earlier, he may have decided that timing it and being direct with hands might be the choice. But there's a, every chance that hey, this kick opens up, and if he starts to expect the hands, he can set a trap much like uh, Mateusz Moraz did for Ahmed earlier. You know, uh, So having a couple of other options that you give makes it much harder for your opponent to set that trap. Yeah, and you need to be clever about this too. If, you're, if your style is you're not really a kicker, then you need to have very like a multiple amount of options to give your partner a problem with as well because yeah. if somebody's kicking, kicking, kicking and you don't have an answer to that type of style, you're going to be in big trouble. So you need to have a couple of options and a couple of tools in your uh, toolbox there to come up with that. So let's maybe jump from there to look at uh, some of the, the non-scoring actions. So uh, we, we, we'll talk a little bit about the little and micro advantages, I suppose, that you can take throughout your spar. Yeah, like these, like most matches at the high level will come down to the last maybe 20 seconds and there's always a good chance there's going to be a warning that will decide it and might mm. may even flip it either way so we see here germany in blue doesn't go for a score but he just pushes zuck out of the the ring to gain a warning um and and that's it's it's a non-scoring action but it's an advantage to germany so it's like they, they all add up and they're important as well and people take them for granted uh you know, it, it is one of those things where, you know, it's well known within sports like rugby and, and so on, you know, the the percentage games. Like it's why mm. they'll kick a certain percentage of kicks and, uh, uh, you know, to touch and so on. They know that the percentages will start to go in their favor eventually and it might take a number of plays. But, you know, within Taekwondo, you can make those small plays, but actually put an advantage on the board in terms of the warnings. You know, we know that you'll score better from the center going out. We know that the the warnings will eventually add up to scores in your favor. So while you're pressing an advantage, why not put that advantage physically on the scoreboard? 
Um, and I think that's what we're seeing here. Yeah, the guys who are winning consistently at the high level, they're they're very good at this. They'll, they'll rack up the warnings and they'll be very, very patient. As we said, they're short rounds. But you'll see that the high level guys, they, they don't kind of go gung ho. They're, they're very patient in their in their build up to, to get going. And they're happy to rack up warnings if it's the first round, for example. And then mm-hmm. you may see them kick it on a gear in the second round when they have that 4 0 advantage clearly on the board already. So it's uh, it's something that you will need if you want to compete at the high level. Let's look at that extreme example of where a warning can be critical. Yeah, so. just a bit of context on this one. Um, team sparring here from 2014. So we were actually down on this one, and we need to bring it back 9-9. This is match five. So um, Poland were winning. pause there and have a look at the, the screen. You can get some idea of the uh, the scores. Um, so, yeah, it's three. Is it 3-1 right now? Yeah. So we yeah. actually needed it to be 3-0 for us to win, or for us to draw. So it ended up going to sudden death. If not, then we were out. So, like, this is incredible here, the, the fact that you're able to read the board this quickly, realize how many flags you need, and go and press it. And there's so only that one bottom left scorecard there where we're in the yeah. game at all. It's the 1-2. So, uh, Dylan in blue there needs to uh, level that scorecard to bring it to three one zero. That's the game that's in play at the moment. Yeah, so... the. There's no real shot drawn here, but he recognizes he needs warning, presses, covers up, and just pushes his opponent out of the ring. Gets the warning as uh, Radek comes back up there. He probably realizes now that he maybe he's thinking that, okay, I'm all right here, we're safe. And then realizes once the board flips, as you see in the background, boom, and that's the difference. Keeps us in the game and we can go to sudden death. So, yeah, it's very important, like the non-scoring actions, because they make all the difference in the, the really high level. Yeah, we'll see it flipping a lot of time as well at the Euros Absolutely. and the Worlds. But so, um, yeah. the thing is, there's the, there's an element of watching the scoreboard flip with one or both players not aware of how it's going to yeah. go versus someone making a calculated action or a calculated decision that, okay, I have this warning to concede, you know, or I need to force an error. I need to force a warning. And recognizing that it's more likely that you'll uh, achieve your outcome that way than by chasing the score. So, for example, in that particular scenario, Dylan going for a score, yes, he might get that one scorecard to flip. He might. But it's a case of he knows what he needs is the warning. So he'll press the score, but there's how much pressure and how, you know, maybe we can more safely force that warning as long as uh, Radic is moving backwards. Whereas one score isn't going to make any difference on the other three scorecards at all. You know, so it's it's that element of recognizing, hey, what, what's the best percentage chance that I have here? Mm-hmm. So let's just before we go into the uh, the, the very important uh, thing that for me, it's that little acronym that kind of underpins all of the tactical decisions of the win mentality. What's important now or what is next? Uh, before we do that, let's just look at space, because so often yeah. these decisions have you know, uh, the, the space is a factor in the decision. Yeah, because even the last one we've seen, there was a factor of the, the ring position. So where, where you are and the space that you have is vital. So here, Ahmed is getting pressed back from the beginning. He recognizes it and says, okay, I need to relieve this uh, pressure now. And he goes to hands. So we've seen that clip from earlier, but you can see Mateus puts the pressure on, squeezes the space to the edge, and he's squeezing, squeezing, squeezing. Ahmed realizes, okay, I need to make a move here. And relieves that pressure on the space again this clip was just particularly looking at the the idea of putting pressure on your opponent looking more for the warnings than for the score so we can you can you can tell from the shape of the kick there's no real finishing pressure on it it's placed exactly yeah so like that's an important factor because it ties into uh what we mentioned earlier is that like the, the the closer you are to the edge, the less opportunity the referees will have to score. Plus, the closer you are to the edge, the less options you have as well. Mm-hmm. So, like, the space that's at play is very, very important. And it kind of ties into the non-scoring actions. If you can squeeze space, it gives you an advantage. It mightn't result in a score, but it's going to be effective for you and, and put you in a better position. Yeah, this is the one from previous where I don't know if the microphone went off or something, but they... Um, this, just again looking at two sides to this, so Germany can afford to concede this space at this point in time, but we're looking at, again, that idea of Zouk is looking to put the scores on the board where it matters. It's like pushing from the center going out, and you know we're looking at that right-hand punch and everything as well, saying, look, okay, a couple of judges should see this, but the, 
the intent is okay squeeze the space get the warning do all of the work uh, to give yourself the best possible chance of getting on the sp- scoreboard so you don't know when you start whether it's going to be the pressure the score or the, the travel that's going to matter yeah. most well you're making the, the tactical decision to go and that's the important one so you need to recognize the the game state where you're at what you need to do and if you if you need to go or if you need to hold so that's the important part I lost you again Adrian Ah, okay now I know what the problem was um so again it's similar with it. actually you have both fighters in a very similar position again uh with Germany having that slight lead and uh you know this this is one of those times where the referee is ready to step in to call that warning uh Poland is still pushing but I think it works out in this case to be a bit too little too late but mm-hmm it's still the yeah. right decision, I think. You can you can see Germany here is is complaining that he's still in the ring, but the fact that he didn't give himself enough space at the beginning is the problem. So, yeah, I th- like again, Zuck made a correct decision by squeezing the space and putting more pressure with scores and potential warnings. Yeah, I think it, the only unfortunate when Germany's leg lifts there, he's out of the ring, and the uh, the, sco- the 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 turning kick then can't score. But the. Uh, I think that that awareness, I think Zouk is far more aware of the position in the ring there than Germany is uh, in this particular mm-hmm. situation. Yeah. So jumping into that very, very happy space of what comes next, the like to say the what's important now or what is next. And these are just a couple of examples that put you in that frame of mind where you need to make a decision right away and do the most appropriate thing immediately. Yeah, and particularly with headshots as well, because they're big moments, um, and how you react after that is very important. You don't want to like concede a headshot and then go gung ho again and and give away another shot. But then on the flip side, Davide here makes a great decision to see that okay, my opponent isn't ready, and he takes advantage to gain again. on the momentum he just got. So that's that's a sign of a high level competitor as well who sees it, goes, and they're relentless getting in there to get that extra point on the board. And I think that's what we're talking about, isn't it? You know, when it comes to those t- good tactical decisions, yes, you're looking at improving the state on the scoreboard, but also the game state can be changed by momentum. So mm-hmm. when when things are rolling your way, it, it does make it uh, kind of easier to maximize those scores. And, and that critical decision here of what does Carl decide to do and, and clearly doesn't make a great decision there. So it's can he push out right away? Can he change the spacing? Can he, you know, because... But but it's a what's a positive decision? What do I do to improve the game state? Whereas suggesting that it wasn't a score probably doesn't help with the game state, you know. Yeah, exactly. So it's important. Next is the is the key here. We see again, Mateus scores a headshot, and Ahmed's making a positive action directly off that. Again, looks to get the hands, and then mm. Mateus recognizes, okay, now I need to push the pace again, and he goes back at it. So it's uh, it's that like it's those micro decisions that are happening in. In with a second of each other really so he scores a headshot kind of pushes back takes it easy Ahmed takes advantage again and now Mateus recognises okay I need to go back on my bike and get to work now again so what I particularly like about that though is that Ahmed isn't checking the scoreboard before he decides to go so that would actually take mm-hmm. away the, uh, the the momentary you know uh, advantage that he has that if, he, if he's stopping there to go and check the scoreboard um, they're kind of judging the, the momentum of it based on the well, I, I know what the game state was before this shot. I need to do something now. Whereas we so often see it with fighters that they want to see did the score register before they yeah, make yeah. the next action. Whereas you just take the worst case scenario. Okay, the score registered. I got to do something positive now. And then when, they get, when, when there's a warning, when there's a stoppage, you can go and check the board and go, okay, this is what I need to do now. Or listen, see what the coach says. But the time it takes for a headshot or, a, or any score to register on the scoreboard by the time it's actually turned up on the scoreboard, you can usually have done something about it. Um, yeah. Because there is a delay as the, yeah, you, you know. Yeah, well, usually with, with the headshots as well, people kind of give a bit of space because they almost want to say, oh, take a look at that. Referees yeah. take note of that one. Um, so that actually does usually give people an opportunity to kind of get back into it and, and go again. Absolutely. So I suppose, how do we summarize all of what we've said there in relation to the, the tactical uh, decision making? 
Yeah, well, well, for me, it's it's the most important factor in um, people who are very close. It's, if people are at a similar level, it's going to come down to the decision making within those like micro battles. And today mm. we just went through four examples, but there, there's lots of them. And um, so for me, it's the most important skill that you can have at the high level because it, it is the difference maker. And I think the you know sometimes you can get into that twist between is the tactical decision making a skill or is that a part of every skill that you have? So the the, the where, when, and how to use every skill that you have mm. is is part of the tactical decision making. So they're they're they weave together very very well. But I think that's where if your skills are out of context, uh, if they're not representative in terms of how you practice them, this is what goes missing. The ability yeah. to choose the right action at the right time and with a split seconds notice or in, in the right moment is the part that's missing. So understanding where, when, how to vary things, how to change things uh, and what kind of options you have, that's all done. It's put in the bank at home. And the the more you've had, uh, the way to practice making good tactical decisions is to be faced with the decision over and over again, explore your solutions and figure out what works and what doesn't. Yeah, you have to be in the situation often because everybody who's following us on uh, Instagram knows I'm always harping on about when you're sparring training, having two active sides. Um, mm. And th this is the reason why, because when you have an objective and I have an objective and we're both training together, we have to always be making those decisions as we're training, trying to come up with a solution to whatever the situation we're training in. So that's what we're going to focus this week on uh, our members academy. So every week we're going to show you guys how to actually work on this for your um, sparring game. So we're actually going to cover some other ones as well that are very important tactics. So if tactical decision making is something that you want to improve on, you think, okay, I'm, I feel comfortable in like my techniques and things, but using those um, techniques is, is a problem for me and how to get them going and use them in the correct context and the correct situation, then we're going to cover that today and give you some um, very important ways to, to come up with some training solutions and important situations that you need to be comfortable in if you want to make it to uh, that, that difference maker really between people who may be at the similar level to you. Absolutely. So uh, with that, we will wrap up today's episode uh, for next week. We're going to be looking at how to introduce uh, a new skill, how to find a way to introduce a new element into your game, uh, particularly something you might not be confident or comfortable with in the beginning. Uh, so this is definitely something that a lot of the uh, the folks on Instagram have been keen to uh, to have a voice on. So you'll have to wait till next week to see which techniques we, ch we tackle, uh, but will definitely be part of our conversation for next week. So until then, have a good week, everyone. See you in the next one.